Howdy. How to lose money in real estate. Most channels focus on how easy it is. Even a lazy person can do this. Or what the cash flow is. Um, last week we did a video with the three amigos, uh, Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time and Matt the Lumberjack Landlord on what the first five years of investing look like compared to the last five years of investing. Basically showing that this is worth it. <sighs> but it's not always puppies and kittens. I'm going to go over some of the really common ways that people lose money in real estate. And then I'm going to cover the easiest way that people lose money in real estate. If this is your first time to my channel and you're checking out a live stream, especially if you're into real estate, the purpose of my content is to help the average individual realize that you can reach financial freedom in 10 years or less and make work optional, even if you're not starting from the best position. That's the purpose of every video that I make. A lot of the videos are short. I try for 10 to 20 minutes teaching a concept or a strategy that you'll use to be more successful in investing. Live streams tend to be a bit longer. The first 10 to 20, sometimes 30 minutes, covers a topic like this. So this might be the portion of the video that you rewatch. It's not really a list because some of these things kind of overlap. But one of the first ways that people lose money in real estate is by not having focus. I like the saying, if we chase five rabbits, we starve. And that doesn't mean that you don't study a bunch of different strategies like wholesale, flipping, the Burr method, buy and hold, short-term rental, long-term rental, local at a distance, storage, commercial, all the different ways that you can invest in real estate. And that was not a comprehensive list. But look for the one that makes sense to you. What fits your schedule? And then focus on that type of strategy, but be ready to pivot. You may have to change your strategies based on what happens in your market. One of the things that's really important to picking the rabbit that you're going to chase or the strategy is understanding what your exit is. If you are looking to make work optional, in my case, I like buy and hold rentals that I don't plan on ever selling. I don't plan on, I don't really plan on ever tapping the equity. So I'm not really worried about appreciation or principal pay down where actual wealth comes from. I'm more concerned with cash flow to make work optional. And since I don't ever plan on selling, it's literally until death do we part. I want my kids to inherit my properties. There are strategies like Chris Crohn's, really good YouTube channel to check out. It's Chris Crohn. Both of those start with a K. High energy, um, gets you excited. He might have changed now that he's much larger and he has a bigger um, subscription base and he does syndications. But when he was first starting out, his focus was to buy and hold rental properties, keep it for about seven years before the large CapEx things kick in, and then sell it, preferably with a lease to purchase where the tenant becomes the buyer. Higher rate, still owns the note, uh, can foreclose if the tenant stops to pay, stops paying, and he gets out of it before he has those large expenses. If your strategy is something like wholesaling or flipping, you really have to worry about, or not worry about, but figure out your exit strategy because those are episodical. They're like a job. You stop working, money stops coming in. Figuring out the strategy that you want to focus on helps you figure out the tactics you need to know. If you're going to do flipping, you need to find properties that need work, that have that equity that you can build in. You need a list of buyers. You need, there's different tactics for flipping versus buy and hold. There's different tactics for finding a 20 unit apartment complex versus finding a duplex. So figuring out that strategy and your end, your end goal will tell you what you need to learn to get there. One of the easiest ways to lose money in real estate is to think that you don't need money to invest in real estate. Look at how many books there are and how many YouTube channels focus on how to invest in real estate with little or no money down. Brandon Turner from Bigger Pockets, it's one of his first books he put out was how to invest with little or no money down. The mistake is when a new investor thinks, I don't have any money, so that must be the strategy for me. Investing with little or no money down doesn't mean that you don't have money. It means that there are 
strategies for investing in real estate that don't take a lot of your capital. But you need reserves. You need an emergency fund because problems are going to come up. Some people talk about getting into flipping. And the idea is you use or using the Burr method. Use hard money to acquire the asset so you don't have a lot of your own money in the deal. You use the money that you borrowed to fix the property, and then you either refinance your money out or you sell the property. What if you get the after repair value wrong? What if it, the, the timeline is wrong? What if it doesn't appraise? All of those things that can go wrong. If you don't have money to solve the problem, not only do you lose the property, you lose any investors you're working with, you could walk away from a rental property that you lose in debt. You could still owe money on a property you don't even own anymore. So if you're going to think of a strategy where you invest with little or no money down, you want to have reserves. You still need to learn how to save. The order of operations for real estate is the same for everybody. Starts with saving. If you don't know how to live on less than you make when you're making not a lot, you're not going to magically start saving when you start making more. <laughs> Actually, th this next subject kind of came to me when I was listening to the latest Real Estate Rookie podcast. I think it was like exit one. Uh, episode 155. And I was very excited about the episode. This was a service member. She was doing buy and hold. She'd used her VA loan. She talked about how you can use it more than once. And she was doing buy and hold properties to build cash flow. Getting out of the military as with as real estate agent and having rental income so that she has a side hustle to support growing the business of real estate. And then in the last five minutes, she said something that broke my heart. An easy way to lose money in real estate is to think bigger is better. Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, six or seven lessons in there, I forget how many. I focused on the first and third the most. Talks about the monopoly theory. From the game Monopoly. Three green houses, one red hotel. Three green houses, one red hotel. The concept that a lot of new investors have is, and, and we hear this because there's so many books on this, that don't get into the problem. You buy single family houses or duplexes or triplexes or fourplexes. You grow a portfolio and then you sell and you 1031 into a 20 unit apartment complex. There is a massive difference in the lending options for four units and less or five units and more. There's a list of reasons why I don't want to invest in five units or more. To Build passive income that makes work optional. It doesn't take a lot of properties. I actually reached financial independence where I made work optional with only seven units. So it doesn't take 40, 100, or 8,000 like some of the investors we see on YouTube. It only took seven to actually make work optional. I was making $100 more a month with seven rental units than I was making when I was a police officer. So not a lot of money, barely a livable life, but work was optional. Cops don't make a lot. When you have five units or more, here's the problem. Right now, when I buy a fourplex and I'm being paid to live here, I live in one of the units, rent out the other three, I have 30 year fixed rate debt. If property values drop by 30%, I don't care. It would be buying things on sale. I don't care about the properties I already have. I'm not losing anything because I'm not using equity. I don't worry about appreciation or principal pay down. I'm working with cash flow. And after the 2008 crash, rents actually went up. So I'm not worried about a crash or a correction. I'm more worried about people who say that there's a crash or a correction coming. The problem with five units or more is you have usually an adjustable rate. Usually you have, it, it can be 20 or 30 year amortization, but you'll have what is called a loan reevaluation period or a balloon payment it can be either one. So in five, seven, or 10 years, you either need to come up with a bunch of money, which means a refinance. You're hoping that your net operating income has improved so that you can refinance. You're hoping that um, prices have gone down or interest rates have gone down in the future. And if, if you've met the government, that's probably not going to happen. What if you have a bad year? The one year they're going to do a loan reevaluation and you don't have the net operating income to justify it. Um, you could be forced to sell when you're underwater. Again, walking away from a property in debt. You can be forced to refinance for an interest rate that is higher and now you can't afford the payments. 
especially when you had a bad year. And that's why your net operating income didn't look good enough. It is possible to get 30 year fixed rate debt on commercial properties, 15, 20 units. Generally, you have to have the portfolio to support it like Michael Zuber does. For most of us, when we're just starting out, most lenders aren't going to offer us that type of product. So the biggest barrier for me is that it's not a 30 year fixed rate debt. The loan reevaluation period kills it for me. So my plan, my ultimate plan in investing, no matter how big my portfolio go, grows, is to stay four units or less. I like the fixed rate debt. When I get to 10 mortgages, and from then on, we go to commercial lens, loans because we can only have 10 mortgages in our name. I only have six right now. I have seven properties, six mortgages. And out of the, those seven properties, there's 16 rental units. When I get to 10 and I have to go for commercial lending, then I might consider maybe more than five units, but I still think I'm going to want to do anything I can to avoid a loan revaluation period because small multifamily, four units or less, the value of the property is based on comps. What do other properties in the area sell for? Five units or more, the value of the property is based on profit. Does that profit make, does that property make money? If it does, value goes up. If it makes more, value goes up. If it goes down, value goes down. Since 2013, when in 2008, property values took a nosedive and they slowly went back up in 2013, they started to pass where they were in 2008. And a lot of people started saying, don't buy now. Prices are as high as they were in 2008. There is a crash or a correction coming. So if you buy, then you're going to lose value. If you wait, you're going to be able to buy it on sale. From 2013 until 2022, people have been saying, don't buy now because prices are too high. This is unsustainable. There's a million reasons why there's going to be a crash or a correction. They always quote price. They talk about interest rates. <laughs> we do not have any of the indicators that we had in 2008. We're starting to see some, but if those went into effect today, that's a three to five year problem from now. We don't have adjustable rate mortgages. It was over 50% in, before the crash in 2008. We're under 5% right now that are doing adjustable rate mortgages. We don't have ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets, where they, you could just walk into a bank and say, I make $400,000 a year, give me a loan. And you sign a thing and they loan you the money. We don't have 105% loan to value mortgages as a normal. Uh, people were wrapping closing costs into the loan, borrowing 100%. So prices dip, your interest rate goes up, you can't make the payment and you can't refinance because you're underwater on the property. That's the problems we don't have now. Where I say that we're starting to see those problems is lenders are starting to push adjustable rate mortgages. Now they're not hitting ninja loans and they're not hitting 105% loan to value yet. But when those things start to happen, now we can predict with the crystal ball, which is over there out of my reach, um, three to five years for there to be a correction. So the longer you wait, the more you're going to pay. Some people say, well, if interest rates keep going up, like we keep hearing there's going to be seven rate increases in 2022, prices will come down because of payment. And that's not true. <clears throat> price uh, Interest rates don't set prices. Wages do. And we are seeing record wage inflation. And now we're starting to see a 40 year loan product. So if you take the loan and instead of borrowing it over 30 years and having a payment, you can borrow it over 40 years, which brings the payment down, which means we have a window right now where we can start using the 40 year loan product. But in the next six months to a year, prices will adjust and go. I'm, I'm estimating a 15 to 20% increase in prices of properties just based on the 40 year loan product. Add to that, wage inflation, people needing to be bribed to come back into the office to get off of unemployment, extra unemployment, extended unemployment, all the free money that's been given out over the last almost two years. So waiting for a crash or a correction means that you're going to miss out on all the stuff that people from 2013 have been missing. Cash flow, appreciation, principal pay down, literally almost a decade of people waiting for something that hasn't happened yet. When we lose money in real estate, 
it's usually on our first or second deal. As we're figuring out what we want to do and how things work, as we learn the timing and what it's like to find a contractor, find a tenant, screen a tenant, place a tenant, keep a tenant, all the things that it takes to, to make that happen. So one of the things I don't recommend doing is when you're first investing in, the, in those first two or three rentals, don't pull out home equity on your primary residence. Don't put your house where you live at risk. Don't take a loan against your 401k or your retirement account. Don't put those funds at risk in the window of time when we're most likely to make our mistakes. Once you have two or three rentals and you understand the timeline and you understand how to get area average rents and you've learned your market and you have a reasonable sense of confidence in your ability to get the return you're looking for, then it makes sense to take risks with those other items like your home equity or your retirement accounts. But I wouldn't start with that in the beginning. You want to lose the money you've saved to invest, not the money you've saved to live or to retire in the beginning. Here's one I almost fell prey to. One of the easiest ways to lose money in real estate is to listen to advice from investors. The people you know are not in your position. They don't have your resources. They don't have your goal. They might not have the same strategy. When I first started looking at investing in real estate, I thought buy and hold. I have a friend who has over 30 rental units. He's absolutely financially free. He's a real estate agent. So I go to him and I say, hey, I want to invest in real estate. Be my mentor. I took him to lunch. I used the term mentor and he flinched because he didn't want to be a mentor. He didn't want a mentee. The first two small multifamily properties that he suggested to me would have bankrupted me because while he has 30 rental units, out of all of those, he's only ever owned one duplex. All of the rest are single family. And as an agent, he had decades sitting in his Windermere office waiting for the best deal to walk in the door to buy it. I was trying to use mortgages using a cash flow calculator he's never had to worry about. So your agent and your lender and the people you know who have invested successfully in real estate aren't your advice. They shouldn't be your mentors. They should, they could be a sounding board to bounce ideas off of. But again, they don't have your resources. They don't have your starting position. They don't have your goals. Find somebody. Once you've learned the strategy you want and you start to learn the basic tactics that go with it, find somebody who's done that to emulate. Somebody who's invested in and use the Burr method. I would not help you do the Burr method. I haven't done one. I wouldn't help you do flipping. I couldn't be the best advice for you. I would be able to help you find somebody who does know that stuff. Same thing with buy and hold. I invest in small multifamily in my area. I don't invest at a distance. So if I was going to invest at a distance, I would start with David Green's book, uh, the book on long distance investing, educate myself, watch a bunch of YouTube channels on investing at a distance to learn that before I took action. One of the things to really remember about your lender and your agent while they work in the industry, they work in the business, Again, I said they're not your mentor because they don't have the same starting point, goal, resources. They're not your mentor because their job, your lender's job, is to sell loan products. Your agent's job is to conduct transactions, to make sure things close. They might have the best intentions. Most of the lenders I've talked to with decades of experience have no clue how cash flow works. They're looking at a metric that says our charts say you're approved for the next loan for up to this amount. But they're not looking at the way an investor looks at, the timeline. What is my NOI? What is my uh, cash on cash return? They're just looking at a chart that says you're a safe enough bet to do this loan with. So be really careful looking at your lender or your agent for advice, especially with the statistic of most real estate agents never own one rental property. I've worked with both investor and agents who have properties and invest in the agents. One was brand new, like brand new starting out. I've done four transactions with him now. Uh, the one with a ton of experience was the one that would have set me up to have some problems. I'm, I'm so glad I didn't land those first two properties once I actually educated myself and learned to run the numbers. Uh, man, the new agent who had never invested but was starting out had a good brokerage and a good um, 
not a mentor, but an agent at the thing that he could go to for help. And so he, as he was learning, I didn't need an agent that knew what was happening because even if an agent knows the first one I worked with, doesn't mean that they have your starting point, resources, and goals. So if the agents and the lenders might not understand cash flow, <laughs> that should be your first step. Understand the math. Matt, the lumberjack landlord, often says, it's only math. It is only math. Math is the first step for screening a property. There's several other things that you're going to do to screen a property to help limit tenant turnover and to protect your asset, to diversify. But learning how to run the math, learning that cash on cash return on investment, COC, ROI, understanding that by knowing what the prices are, what the interest rates are, so you know what your payment's going to be, how much insurance costs, what the taxes are for your area. That's one of the biggest problems too, and I'll cover that in a second, is taxes is a mistake that a lot of people when they invest in real estate make a mistake with that. But you also have to know how to understand the area average rents and how to get that quickly. If, if you don't know how to get area average rents, how can you figure out what you're going to make? I actually had a lender, a lender tell me this. During the transaction, basically communicating back and forth with emails saying, yeah, I'm, I'm buying this, this duplex. And he said, oh, well, if your payment's this, you just need to set your rents at this. His perception was you have expenses. So as the owner, you can set your rents where you want to make sure you're going to make a profit. I, I have not worked with that lender since. Uh, and not because of that, because I don't care what their knowledge of investing was. There was other reasons, but that's not how rents, it's not how any of real estate works. Area average rents set rents. Wages set area average rents. Supply and demand is a factor too. So learn how to find the area average rents. Originally, I would use Rentometer. And yesterday uh, on Valentine's Day, when I'm recording this, there was a deal where you can get a, a year's worth of Rentometer for $39. And two years ago, up, at, up until two years ago, I used Rentometer pretty consistently. They were pretty accurate, but they were using a year's worth of data. And they would look at the last 12 months and they would get the area average rents that way. In 2020 and 2021, rents went up so fast that was inaccurate. Historical data no longer worked. So for the last two years, I have not used Rentometer. And I would go to apartments.com, Craigslist. Um, when I was using Rentometer, I used to call the housing authority because Section 8 was pretty accurate. But they've fallen behind too. Recently, Rentometer changed from a 12-month period to a quarter period. So you look at three months and their rents are more, more accurate. I, they'll probably catch up for 2022. They weren't very good in November, December, 2021. So you can use Rentometer, but still, like you are a renter, go to apartments.com, Craigslist, maybe Trulia, Zillow, Redfin, any of those platforms, Facebook Marketplace, and think, if I was trying to rent right now in my area the same number of bedrooms, what would my rents be? Find that yourself. Until you learn your area. Once your area, you don't have to do the research that much every time. You just have to follow. Look it up every now and then to see what's happening with it. The 1% rule is flawed and outdated. That is not a math system anybody should be using to buy properties. There are some markets where it works. In those markets, sure. But that doesn't point out, is property tax 1000 a year or 16000 a year? You know, literally California and New Jersey, there's a massive difference in their taxes. Do you have a $500 a month HOA or is there no HOA at all? The cash on cash method is the easiest way to figure out if a deal is worth pursuing. What is the return going to be using as many factors as you can? Four units or less, I have never once heard or understood what a cap rate is. I don't need to. I'm not investing in commercial five units or more where cap rates can have some kind of an impact. So if you're going commercial, learn what a cap rate is. I've studied a lot of videos, never been able to find a way to apply it to in any way that makes sense or means anything to four units or less. One of the main reasons to learn how to do the math is speed. The easy, another easy way to lose money in real estate is to not take action. You need to know your market, the, the footprint of where your business is. 
what area are you looking at? You need to know what the area average rents are. So when you see a property that hits the, the MLS, each area is a little different. Study your market. In my area, between Tacoma and Olympia and Washington State, if a small multifamily hits the MLS, first off, it's on the MLS. Redfin, Zillow, that is dated. By the time the properties I've purchased have hit Redfin and Zillow, they were already closed and it was almost a month after I closed. So that's a two month gap at least from when I saw it on the MLS to when it finally popped up on those secondary areas or secondary platforms. When it hits the MLS, I have between one and two hours to get an offer in, an actual official emailed offer with DocuSign. If you wait more than a couple of hours, it's gone. Most of us as investors think, if I was going to sell a property, here are the steps I would take. I would get an agent. I would find out an estimate of my property. I would ask for comps. I would do comparables. I would figure out what I think I'm going to get for it. I would list. I would make sure it was on as many platforms for visibility as possible. I would wait several days to see what offers come in. And then I would go for the strongest one, most likely to close, that's going to get me the best price. Logically, as an investor, all of that makes sense. I should make a video on how to do that. Sellers are rarely investors. A lot of sellers are people who inherited the property. Somebody who tried real estate and 10 or 20 years later has realized it is not for them. And they've not really been an investor. They haven't kept up with technology. They haven't educated themselves. I, I have friends who own rental properties who have never once raised rent on a tenant, which works fine for them. But when we see a property for sale, we're thinking as an investor, what would I want? Some people who inherit it or just want out of the property purchased a property at, at a fraction of what it's selling for now and can't mentally get their mind wrapped around how much they're actually going to make. So when you make an asking price offer within a couple of hours, usually the people I've been working with that get their offers accepted, and, and yes, we get outbid sometimes, but that seller jumps on it. They want to get this locked down. Do things like submit a letter that's from your lender that says you're most you're, you're likely to close. You're a strong borrower. You're not the first deal with them, or whatever your history is, to make it more likely to get closed to, to get accepted. But speed is a huge factor. One of the easy ways to lose money in real estate is to be lazy. I'm a lazy person. I, I invest in such a way that makes a lazy person's life better. But I don't want to be lazy when I'm investing. When you purchase a property and you can tell that this was a house that added the other side for a duplex, or it's a house with a built out basement or something that looks like there's been a value add to the property, check permits. Each area is different, but the laws can really get you into a lot of trouble. You can usually tell when an appraiser does the, the appraisal and, and you're looking at like a three bedroom, two bath, and the value comes back at a two bedroom, two bath because it used to have a den and the house has a septic. And with the county, it's filed that that septic supports two bedrooms. So that den has been converted to a bedroom. It looks like three bedrooms. You're gonna rent it out as three bedrooms, but it's non-conforming. And in some areas, if tenants find out and they take you uh, in, into the city, not only do they get to move out and break the lease, but you could have to give that person back every penny of rent because it was a non-conforming rental. If you go to sell it and it's not permitted, again, when done right, that appraiser will only see two bedrooms and two bathrooms in a den. So you might not expect the appreciation you would off of a three bedroom, two bath. Check for permits, make sure work is legal, make sure that the property is zoned for what you're going to use it for. I think in most areas, they've gotten away from a lot of the single family house zoning, but there were times where there was single family zoning where there was a duplex and it was not zoned. Uh, I looked at a trailer park with a friend. We were not trailer park, mobile home park. Don't know the vernacular because I haven't invested in it yet, but we looked at it was non-conforming and, and there was too much risk with that property. Everybody saying, oh, it's grandfathered in, but we don't control what the next person who gets into that position with your county or your municipality is going to say about that property. One of the things I actually did where I lost money in real estate in the very beginning is I didn't run it like a business. A couple of weeks ago, one of the live streams was how to run it like a business. 
I didn't have a lease. I leased with a handshake. I didn't have a backbone to stick to a lease, even if I had one. But how would you run this as a business? Think if you were a property manager working for someone else and had to explain to that person, how did you screen your tenants? How did you set your rents? How did you justify the repairs? <clears throat> one thing I understand, work. I, my W-2 job is I work at a truck driving school. I'm the president of commercial driver school here in Washington State. I believe I perform a lot better working for people than if I owned the company. Same with rentals. If I in the beginning, I just I just had a rental. I didn't even see myself as a landlord. I was I was just going to rent it out to a friend because who can trust a, a stranger, right? But if if I was running a business, I would prefer to rent to a stranger, a stranger who's more likely to be held to a contract. I would have a contract, and then I would stick to that contract. Doesn't mean you you can't make concessions and say, okay, I understand with this exact reason why your rent's going to be a week later. Whatever you can do, but. Run it like a business. How would a business handle that? Look at property management before you self-manage to see how they run it. When it comes to running it like a business, one of the things that a lot of investors do is we forget to self-educate. Doesn't seem a problem if you're one of the 48 people sitting here right now watching. You are here self-educating yourself. But when I first started, I thought, I want to make work optional. I want to invest in real estate and replace my living expenses without any education whatsoever. To, to become a Marine, it was it was 13 week boot camp, infantry school, MOS training. To become a police officer, it was a six month academy. If I wanted to work in a, uh, a field that required a degree, you're talking years in college to get that degree to work in that field. And I thought, I'll just jump into some industry, replace my living expenses with no education whatsoever. And that can be video, that can be um, podcasts, that can be audio books, it can be networking, local REI meetups, go and, and get that interaction going. Self-education. We're almost done with the easiest ways to uh, lose money in real estate. And then I have the actual easiest way to lose money in real estate. The next one is not shopping around. I've talked about it a few times. I'm a lazy person. I don't want to be a lazy investor. I want to invest in such a way that lets me lead, let me lets me live a lazy life. There's a difference. We shop around for contractors. I use the Thumbtack app. It's a good way to find contractors, get quotes, read reviews. If I'm going to add a deck, I want at least three quotes, right? How, how much is the materials that they're going to source? How much is the labor? Three quotes to figure out which is the best one. Doesn't always mean it's the cheapest one. It's just going to be the one that makes the most sense for that project. Most people understand that. Hardly anybody shops at least three real estate agents. Not only did I talk to many more than three agents to find the ones I work with, but I work with three at all times, three agents or more with auto searches set up. They're all aware of each other. They know that whichever person sends me the actual deal I want to pursue is going to be the one who gets the work. Most people won't take the time to compare rates and fees and terms with at least three lenders. We'll take the time to talk to three contractors for a $5,000 deck, but we don't want to send the five to 10 emails it takes to get three quotes for a 30 year commitment for hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can easily lose money in real estate if you don't shop around, which includes shopping around for tenants. One of the mistakes we make as a new investor, especially is when we have a vacant unit, we want to fill it. We're missing a couple words there. We want to fill it with a good, reliable tenant. We don't just want to fill it. If you don't learn how to screen your tenants properly and find a good lease and shop tenants, figure out which platform finds you the best tenants in your area. That could be Facebook Marketplace. could be Craigslist. could be I have the best luck in my area with apartments.com. Whichever one works the best in your area that has the most eyes on properties is the one you're going to want to learn, learn to use. One of the ways that we lose money in real estate <laughs> is forcing a strategy. We decide, I want to buy single family houses. I want to buy small multifamily. I want to buy storage. I want to burr. I want to whatever. Whatever your strategy is, you've picked it. You pick your market, you pick your strategy, and then you go there and you make it work. That's like a police officer showing up at a crime scene and looking at all of the evidence and thinking, 
I think this happened. This is what I think happened. Now, let me find the evidence to back that up. And that's not how a police officer does it. You show up at a crime scene, you look at all the evidence, you let the evidence tell you a story, you make an assumption, literally an assumption, that's an investigation of what the evidence tells you. And you change your assumption when you find evidence that points out something else. Real estate investing is the same way. You look at your market, you look at the evidence in your market, which one's cash flow? Single family, like in the Ohio area where my friend invests, or sink small multifamily where I invest in Washington? Or is it storage? Is it Airbnb? What, what strategy is working best in that market that gets you the return you're looking for? And then, because somebody is investing successfully in almost every market, even the super expensive, high cost of living areas, somebody's pulling it off. Sometimes it's that area is so high they're investing at a distance. That's a possibility. But what strategy is working? And then change your assumption based on the evidence that you see. The easiest way to lose money in real estate is to lose money in real estate. That is me channeling my inner Mitch Hedberg. Some people will say, I'm going to buy this property. I don't care that it loses money because there's principal paid on every month. Rents are going to go up. It's going to appreciate massively over time. I'm going to buy land and just hold it for 20 years, and pay taxes on it, and hope that things develop in the area. The easiest way to lose money in real estate is to lose money in real estate. Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time says it's great. It says it really well. He says, I want you to buy great deals. Learn average, find the good or great deals and go for great. I think learn the area average and go for good or great deals because a base hit is acceptable to me. Enough base hits in a row and you're going to see a, a really huge change to your life. Once you have cash flow and you've replaced work and you've learned the basics, yeah, step your game up. Stop going for good, go for great. But don't plan on losing money. Or you. That's as simple as that one gets. The reason it's going to seem like that's a good option is you're going to hear about people who lost money over time. They literally lost money every month, but then sold the property for two or three million more than what they bought it for. Some investors grow up portfolio to the point where it's large enough to take five or 10 or $50,000 to Vegas, put it all on black, just a red, whatever, just see what happens. If they win, great. It's a good night. If they lose, it isn't going to hurt them. They have the cash flow and assets and position to where that was an acceptable loss. So they might go and take one or 5% of their net worth and put it in crypto or in a specific stock that they haven't even studied that. They just think, I think that company is going to grow. So I'm going to put it all on there. They haven't studied which coin is doing performing the best. They haven't looked at the history of the coin. They haven't studied how blockchain works. They haven't done anything, but they can risk throwing that one to 5% there. So if you heard about somebody who purchased a property, banking on appreciation, and they won, because they're not going to talk about the times they lost, look at their whole picture. What does the rest of their portfolio look like? What risk was that to them? But when you're starting out, and it, it took me two years to save the first down payment for my first house hack, if I took that $20,000 and I put it on a property where I was hoping, and I don't want to get caught living on hopium, hoping for appreciation, I'd probably still have to work. And to quote my friend Cody, that's no fun.